Hi, my name is Guido. Uh, I'm a Debian developer. I work for Google. I'm involved in the Ganetti project, which is a cluster virtualization project system. And today we're talking about interesting networking features in the Linux kernel. Um, it's mostly kernel related things, a couple of things outside. Basically, like it's experiences that I've had in the last year and I wanted to share with you guys. Uh, the reasons behind this is that before we used to have these huge network equipments like big routers, big switches, and so on, and uh, Linux started entering on servers. Debian uh, now runs a lot of interesting places, like we heard in some talks before. But, and yeah, we, we scared away a lot of people that thought that we weren't ready to do this and we weren't serious enough and so on. But the networking people maintained control over their network until now. We're starting to see very interesting things happening in Linux. Um, unfortunately, this is very not well documented. Um, some documentation exists only in mailing list posts. Some documentation exists only in source code. I had to look a few times at the IP route source code to figure out these things because it was like, how do I get this? Um, and yeah, I wasn't courageous enough to start writing an out or documentation. So I said, why don't I just talk to people about it? And at least I'll write some slides. I'll put some things up. It will be on the network. And then we'll figure it out, right? Um, and yeah, I think networking is very fun. It's, it's something which is nice to play with. Uh, just small precautions, like for people who will read the slide later. You can play with this as much as you want on virtual machine or something. If you propose it in a corporation, be careful who you propose it to and how, because they might take it very badly and start screaming and things like that. So uh, just to start with very basic things which we all know. Um, we're, we'll be using IP route around the talk. No fconfig and all stuff because that's outdated and we should forget about that. Uh, hands up if you haven't never seen something like that. I guess everybody has. That's good. Positive. So we're just like adding IP addresses to a device, setting the device up, creating a bridge, uh, adding a device to a bridge we created, uh, managing the routing table, and remembering always to enable forwarding, otherwise we'll ask ourselves why nothing gets routed. What are we going to go through? What are the technologies we're going to talk about? Well, we're going to talk about VLAN tagging, um, tunneling, and a few interesting things about that, uh, policy routing and asymmetric routing, uh, routing demons and anycast, load balancing network namespaces, is everybody already familiar with every uh, all of these technologies? Do you have who's familiar with everything? No, okay. One? Two of them? One of them, okay, okay, one of them, good. Two of them? Okay, good. Three? Uh, we're we're fine, we're fine. I mean, just just to see. Okay. I try to structure them in some useful order to uh, put them together and also in uh, easy to hard maybe or older to newer or something. Uh, there is some order, although I don't know which one is it. So what's VLAN tagging? Uh, what we can do is we can use one single network interface and rather than just transmitting one Ethernet over it, we start transmitting more than one. Uh, we have to agree with the switch about how we're going to do this. Basically, like, there's a protocol which is already set up. It's uh, 802.1Q. And what happens is that once we have an agreement with the switch that our port is trunked, we can say, OK, now send this packet to this VLAN, now send this packet to this VLAN, now send this packet to this VLAN, which means that on a single interface, we get like a view of many virtual Ethernets. Um, this is useful to act as a router if we only have one interface, or for example, if we have one interface or a bundle interface or something, and we connect it to a switch, and then we have VMs hosted on our machine. Uh, remember I said that I work on Ganetti, so I'm like playing with these things over VMs. We can connect 
our VMs to different uh, physical or, I mean, virtual but uh, segmented Ethernets, which means that they won't see broadcast between each other, they will be on different networks and things like that, which is useful. Um, how do we do that? Well, we can create a new link over our main network interface, ADH0, I mean, it could be whatever. We name it whatever we want, it doesn't have to be that name. And then the, the trick is type VLAN ID free. So we tell the kernel, this interface now has a tag VLAN ID free, and you'll call it ATH0.3, and after that, uh, I can send packets, and you're going to talk to the switch that way. Again, if there's a switch, unless the switch is very, very dumb, and then you have another Linux machine on the other side which understands this, uh, the switch is going to throw away your packets if you're not on a uh, allowed trunk port, because it does usually network people don't like people trunking without them knowing. So you have to convince them first, unless you run the switch, which is very handy. Um, after that, we can just set up an IP on the network interface, as we've seen before, and set it up. And then, well, we can use it for uh, connecting to a bridge. We've seen before how we do that with BRCTL. Um, we can add routes pointing to it or things like that and mix it with the other technologies we have. Uh, again, if we add it to a bridge, for example, then it's very easy to connect virtual machines to it, uh, Ganetti, KVM, Xan, any virtualization technologies will allow you to connect a virtual machine to a bridge. So this way you can connect various virtual machines to different VLANs. Um, okay, let's move to tunneling, which is a bit more fun and challenging. Uh, what are we doing is just transmitting IP packets over IP packets. So we're not restricted to VLANs anymore, to Ethernet anymore, and we're doing this on any kind of network. Uh, we don't need support from the networking people. We just need them not to filter our GRE type or IP IP type packets. We're using GRE, we'll say, see why. And basically, we can change the shape of a network. So for example, if we have a rack, and we only have in that rack as many IP as the machines we have in that rack, we can use this to add IPs to the rack and tunnel them the traffic that we need. So add virtual machines where there was no space for them. Um, so yeah, we, we can use it for mobility. For example, we can have a host which is tunneled to another host, then we move it to another host and we start tunneling the traffic to the other one and hope we move the machine and an IP address from one building to another, one data center to another without the networking people realizing uh, if we had the other tunnel endpoint with the IP configured. How do we do this? Well, quite easy, this is the very basic initial stuff. Uh, we just create a tunnel, again, IP tunnel add, uh, the name, GRE0, we can call it whatever. Mod GRE is, could be mod GRE or mod IP IP. We're using GRE because we can do more advanced stuff with it. Um, we can specify the local address and the remote address, uh, a key. The key is interesting later, um, I'll explain why. And the device on which the tunnel actually lives on. So uh, then, Basically, we can add addresses on the tunnel. So now the tunnel is locally for one, and the other side there's for two. We set it up. On the other side, we do the opposite. So for two, for one, and we swapped the real IPs of these two Linux machines. And then at this point, we can ping between for one and for two. Nothing special, but we can also add routes to them. And no, we can't add them to bridges because these are IP tunnels and bridges bridge Ethernet. So don't do that. Well, it won't work. More interesting tunnels. So this tunnel doesn't have any local or remote address. Uh, has the device ATH0, so the local address will be the one of ATH0. If ATH0 has m many addresses, maybe you want to specify an address or it will use the first one. But the interesting thing is that it has no remote address. So basically, it's an unbound tunnel. It can tunnel to anywhere on the internet and on your internet, of course. Any reachable IP is a fair game to have the other endpoint. So you do this on every host. Uh, you create this GRE0 on your, all your 40 hosts, can be in the same rack, can be in different racks in the data center without um, broadcast access to each other, can be around the internet. Then you add these fake IPs, 
And then you set the link up and nothing works because how does the tunnel know where to send the traffic for 4.2, like what's the real internet address? Well, it turns out that the kernel will look it up on the neighbor table. So there are two ways to do this. If you have multicast between all your nodes, you can all subscribe them to a multicast address. Uh, so you specify your local IP, just remote doesn't work, you have to do both local and remote. Then you specify the same multicast address everywhere, and the nodes will automatically do multicast lookups, saying, where is for free? And for free will respond. So it will basically do an ARP, a fake ARP protocol over multicast, and then you have your network already set up automatically. Now, supposing you don't have that because someone disabled multicast, uh, multicast is just broadcast on the network and you don't want to do that, uh, or whatever reason, then you can actually push your uh, neighbor maps permanently on your neighbor table. So in this case, we on all the nodes, we have to specify that uh, uh, node for free is uh, at real IP blah. And like on the device, for the device GRE0, which is the one we created. And at that point, after we've done it statically, it will all work. Now, of course, we don't want to maintain this statically, but we can basically like write a script or have a software that integrates with our virtual machine environment. Uh, we have an example on, of this in Ganetti MBMA, which is a small side software to Ganetti, but it's, it's very basically very easy. And after that, it's easy also to replace this. So basically, once you move a machine between one machine and another, like a virtual machine between a physical machine and another, this command needs to be run everywhere, and our daemon that keeps the mapping up to date will automatically do that, and we have our new mapping. Uh, there are also other specialized protocols to do with this. Uh, one of them is NHRP. It's implemented in this open NHRP package. It's not packaged for Debian, unfortunately. Uh, just source code available. I was thinking of packaging it, but apparently it needs RPD support in the kernel, so we couldn't really use it because, well, we didn't have RPD, and RPD is both experimental and deprecated, so I wasn't going to suggest to add it. So we just went for the user space daemon and neighbor table lookup. The niceness of that solution is that, that's true, the, neighbor is, the, the daemon is user space, but it's only called when the kernel doesn't know, or actually, it's the daemon updating the kernel, but then when actual traffic is coming, everything happens in the kernel. The neighbor table is stored in the kernel. Uh, it scales very well to thousands uh, or hundreds of thousands of entries, and the kernel doesn't need to talk to user space, so it's very fast to actually send the traffic and look up where it should go. Okay, um, let's move to policy routing. What's policy routing? Uh, has anybody done policy routing around? Yeah? Yeah, good. So, what we can do is, rather than having only one routing table, which is our normal routing table, we maintain more than one. So, we give a number to each routing table, um, 100, 101, whatever we want, and then we can specify rules by which different packets get looked up on different routing table. Uh, if you do routing on your virtual machines, and for example, you have your tunnels from before. Uh, by the way, sorry, uh, I said that I was going to say what this key was. Well, suppose you want multiple generic tunnels with different networks. Uh, being them unbound, you wouldn't know when you receive a GRE packet wh which network interface it is it for. This key is going to specify that for you. Uh, now, back to policy routing. If we have more than one of these tunnels on which we want to tunnel traffic, then we can associate the machine with a particular routing table, and that is going to route it to the right tunnel or the other machines that are part of its same network or administrative domain. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how does this work? Well, we're adding a few interfaces. Uh, basically, there is other than IP route and IP rule table. So what we say here is, well, packets coming from the device GRE0 and TAN0 and TAN2, which are probably virtual machines, we can tell Ganetti or our KVM networking script to, to do this for us when it turns out the virtual machine, no need to do it manually, uh, get looked up on table 100. 
Then we can add routes to table 100. I'm using replace because I can use that both to add and to change them later, so I don't need to uh, figure out if the entry is already there, and maybe it was like associated to another interface and I just want to change it because I restarted a virtual machine, whatever. If the old entry is still there, I'm replacing it. Uh, in table 100, I see I should have done probably, yeah, well, no, it should be fine. So we, we can basically like add a static route to that network over device GRE0 via this other link. Um, I think I have to cut the other route there. But basically, the idea is that we can add routes to IPs on various interfaces. So for example, we can say, like, this machine lives on TAN0, so for, for free lives on TAN0, for two lives on TAN2, and everything else uh, route via GRE0. Um, and we can say, basically, then GRE0 will be looked up over the neighbor interface we had before. This is very handy because it follows the rule for a routing table, so uh, stricter entries, like for a single IP, get looked up before broader entries, and we're all sorted. Um, so the last example is to say that there is another network, 5.0, and you have to go through our GRE interface to a gateway there, which is going to route us to this other network or to the internet. Uh, this is the example with the internet, so we can say that the default route is via an endpoint on our GRE network. So we can actually like, say the, the machines don't have access to the nodes at all, and the nodes doesn't do routing for the machines in general, but sends them all to a central place where it can be policied, for example. There can be a central firewall or something like that. Um, a bit more policy routing. So that was the basic part. Other interesting things is that we can add a rule that gets a firewall mark and routes it to some thing, to, to a particular table. And then we can actually add the IP tables rules in the mangled table that, for some type of packets, set this mark. So in this case, for example, what happens is that ICMP fragmentation needed packets get set to mark 100, and this gets set to our, sent to our table 100, which handily gets delivered to our virtual machines. Um, this particular example is useful because uh, when you have your Jerry interface, you usually run into MTU problems. The kernel will create fragmentation needed packets for instances, but it won't know where to route them unless you told it uh, with rules. So for example, in this case, we, we say that if we don't want, in general, the node to speak with the virtual machines, we can say that only the fragmentation needed packets, which are needed because they're generated by the kernel, and we want them to reach their destination, otherwise your copying of files won't work and people will have very strange things, will work. Now, uh, this other interesting thing is the symmetric policy routing. Uh, that's just the IP address, so, well, I should have gone on the other line, but anyway, the line is almost complete. What happens is that on the table, you can add a route which says throw as a destination, which means that basically you stop looking up things on that table and you go to the default table. Or you go to for further rules, which at some point by default go to the default table, or maybe you'll hit another rule for generic defaults or something else. Um, this is interesting because it allows you to create exceptions. So, so to say, for example, OK, I want my default gateway to be this one, but for some internal networks, do asymmetric routing. Don't go over the GRE, but just route locally. And in order to do that, we can just use our normal kernel routing table or use another specialized table for all our uh, different GRE tunnel tables. Uh, since, of course, I've done this example with table 100, but I can have like five of them, 10 of them, and this will all work nicely and insulating. Um, routing demons, uh, most of us probably have played with them at some point. Uh, they're better documented than the rest. They're user space and not in kernel. And these allow you to integrate yourself with the rest of your networking environment if you have a big dynamic network or a small dynamic network, but not only static routes. 
Um, they allow you to acquire routes from the network and to push your own. So for example, again, if you're hosting VMs, it's nice to be able to say, well, route the traffic for these three VMs to this node and for these four VMs to this node. And when you move VMs around, well, your routing daemon is going to see the local rules on your machine and push them to the network and everything, all the packets are going to flow in the right place. Um, so we can push, for example, routes for, as we said, VM or for MBMA networks. So we said before that we have this big network of GRE tunnels and we have one endpoint which acts as a gateway or it could be like done with Anycast or in some other ways, we'll see Anycast later. But basically what we can do is from the endpoint say, oh, uh, our network, which in the example was uh, for zero, is here, like at, at this machine, and then it can route it over the MBMA to the actual destination nodes, yes. Oh, it stands for, so the, the question was, what's MBMA? And it's non-broadcast multiple access. This GRE network is a non-broadcast network since you can't easily broadcast. You would have basically to unicast to all your nodes. And it's multiple access because, well, since it's unbound, you can have many people participating in this network. Um, and yeah. So how to run a routing daemon? Well, I didn't get very far on the example, but install Quagga or there are others, Bird and a few more. There's nice examples. You can test it with VMs, so you don't need to integrate with the network immediately. Start for VMs, route them or connect them to a bridge, and then start exchanging routing tables between them to see that your configuration is correct, your authentication is correct, and things like that. Um, Quagga, for example, supports most routing protocols. You probably want OSPF, OSPF v6, or BGP, depending on what orga your organization runs, because in the end, your and goal is probably to integrate with the routers of your organization. And yeah, you can try things with uh, static routes, which means that if you create a static route on your machine, then it gets pushed and read by the daemon and pushed to the rest of the peers participating in this OSPF or BGP network. Or you can integrate Quagga with your own daemon, for example, with your virtual machine management to say dynamically where your virtual machines are and push the routes correctly. Although if your virtual machine management creates the static routes, then you don't need a particular daemon or whatever code additionally. Any casting? So this is very neat and easy. Any casting is just publishing the same route from two different places. The network just believes that these two are both connected to the destination. What you're actually doing is you're providing the same service, but separately. So you're cheating the network somehow, uh, but it's very useful to increase availability because we, when one of these go down, especially if you do your uh, service correctly, by which if the service is down, the network daemon stops advertising the network, then your traffic automatically gets routed to other places. Uh, you don't need to wait for DNS time propagation to update, but just network route propagation. You can fail over thing gracefully, for example, saying, well, I'm going to stop advertising on this machine, and then when the machine is drained, I can actually, like it's not receiving traffic anymore uh, because the network updated, then I can easily like turn down the service and do updates on it, and nobody's going to notice that out of my five Anycast servers, this one is down. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a very nice technique and it's very easy to implement and it's basically like a trick on the network. We didn't need to add anything to our existing routing protocols. We just started using them in a different way. Um, load balancing, we have this Linux virtual server, probably the worst name ever since it gets confused with everything else which is virtual. Uh, and actually it's talking about sending traffic to real servers. So why virtual? Well, uh, somehow it's, what it means is that the front end is a virtual server and it actually sends the traffic to some backends. Um, for once, it has very good documentation. If you go to that website, it's very easy to set up and like you need your kernel support, but then like there's extended documentation, like long, long how-tos with everything you might need. And it can be used to balance via NAT. So for example, you can have 
a router which balances to a few hosts which are behind it nutted, or you can balance via tunneling, so you can use your GRE tunnels we've seen from before and uh, send your balance traffic over them, or you can use their direct routing, which is useful if you have uh, a physical Ethernet or a VLAN, and it means that basically you don't need to uh, do encapsulation of any type or changing of the packet which you receive, but you just basically send the packets with a different MAC address and the destination machine is going to receive it and handle it because it has that MAC address as an alias which is not published via ARP, so it doesn't confuse the network, but once you send it with the correct MAC address because you're the load balancer and you decide where to send it, it's going to receive it and handle it and already send it back directly to the customer, so to, to the client which tried to contact it, so it basically like halves the traffic need of your load balancer, which is very nice. Uh, with tunneling, for example, you don't, can't always do that. Um, and just to close, well, this is the last thing we're going to talk about, network namespaces. This was a recent addition in the Linux kernel. It doesn't work uh, before 2.6.29, and I'd recommend something newer anyway. While I was playing with the commands I have in the next slide, I managed to crash 2.6.34 a couple of times on my laptop, and then I started trying this on a virtual machine because I was sick of rebooting every time. Um, so the network stack was completely gone. So this is basically uh, a way of insulating processes, and that way you can create uh, basically jails. Uh, what happens is that if you pass this flag to clone, clone new net, the process is going to see a different network environment in which your network interfaces don't exist, and just a local host exists, which is different than the one of the host. Now, after that, you can create new interfaces and share them with the host or move an interface which the host has to a namespace. <coughs> and this allows you to uh, basically insulate processes network-wise. Now, this would be not enough, but luckily there are quite a few clone new thing under clone, so you can unshare the process ID, the file system ID, and a lot of other things to actually create uh, a full jail. Uh, the LXC software automates all of this for you and has nice configuration files and then can start uh, an installed container, so for example, like kind of a virtual machine, which is actually in kernel, uh, like in, again, uh, jails or zone in Solaris or things like that. This is quite new, so it's probably less stable than those, but it's quite nice in the way in which it's done because you don't actually need to do all of this. So you can create a full jail or zone, but you can just like unshare a couple of na namespaces which you need. And in this example, we're just unsharing the network because we're playing with networking and not everything else. And this is not a talk about LXC or uh, container virtualization. So, how do we do that? Well, we can neatly use LXC and share to start a bash in a new network container. This is just going to basically call clone with that flag and then call exec uh, on bin bash. So, our bash now in this shell doesn't have any interface except lo localhost. Uh, localhost is down, everything is down, so we need to bring it up. And then, well, we'll, we'll want another interface to communicate with our external world. So, in the external world, we can create a VATH link, which is a virtual Ethernet, or we can create it with giving names to the interfaces. Uh, I probably meant to just to have a second line and I left the first line by mistake. But basically, this way we say, well, I want a VATH0 and then uh, of type VATH, and then I want a peer named VATH1. And then that last thing which you can see is NetNS, the PID of the bash. So in bash we can do echo dollar dollar or anyway realize what that bash PID is. And it means that the peer is going to appear in that PID. If we don't do that, we can uh, use IP link set NetNS and again move an existing network interface or one that we just created to that namespace. Uh, and yeah, for example, this is totally not documented. If you do man IP, nothing uh, that 
tells you how to do this is var. I had to have a quick look at the source code in order to figure it out. And then I said, well, let's publish it at least on slides, so maybe someone will Google it one day. Um, and then you can create an IP address on this virtual Ethernet interface, which is basically just a local tunnel. And on the other side, at that point, we waited for Shell 2 to finish. So now we have this VATH1 in this case, and we can add it uh, with the opposite IP addresses, set the link up, and at that point, we can ping from within the container to, without, to out of the container. And at that point, this is a virtual Ethernet. We can bridge it. I suppose. I haven't tried, but pretty sure we can bridge it. I'm totally sure we can route on it, so we can send it to uh, our MBMA or our normal routing tables or our policy routing and basically insulate the various containers in the same way that we would virtual machines. Um, there's a bit more which you can do in user space. Uh, I just like brushed on this. All of these packages have uh, good documentation. Um, but just as pointers, OpenVPN, everybody has used it, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, it's nice because you can actually encrypt your IP tunnels or Ethernet tunnels. So uh, GRE you should only use on a trusted environment or over IPsec because otherwise, basically, anybody can spoof your network. If you need something secure, OpenVPN. VDE is a virtual distributed switch. It runs in user space. You can connect uh, uh, processes or virtual machines to it. And then you can connect switches together on various hosts on the internet. So it does the same job in the end as our MDMA tunnel. It will run at a slower performance. But you can like add, again, um, encryption between the various places and things like that. And last but not least, is not only related to network, but SOCAT is basically NC. But you can do a lot more with it. You can use SSL. You can connect to Unix socket. Sockets, you can uh, connect a port to a Unix socket, and all these kind of things which NC doesn't allow you to do. And finally, Q&A and also suggestions, like did I miss any interesting technologies which you think is very cool and should be in this kind of environment? Do you have any suggestions or further hints which I haven't brushed on? Or any other question, although I don't know if I will have the answer or not. Again, it's just sharing what I played with. Thanks very much. I just had a question about your Anycast example. Um, what? The Anycast? Anycast. Well, there wasn't any example. I just well, well, said okay. what it is. Yeah. Right. But how do you avoid horizon problems with, so you're essentially putting the same service on the same IP in two different places. Yeah. But at some point, there's a router that's going to have to make a decision about how to get there. So I'm just curious, could you just give an example of how of where you use that? Um, uh, well, I basically, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, <laughs> sorry. It's all right. I, I'm just trying to figure out how it seems. I mean, it's a cool yeah, idea. Basically, yeah, basically, yeah, probably idea. it is uh, an interesting point. I, I'm sure it's a solved problem because it's used in production for lots of things. Many DNSs nowadays run with Anycast. Uh, so actually, you think you're reaching an IP address, but you're reaching service servers which are actually near to you. But I'm not sure how exactly this is dealt with. Uh, probably BGP has ways to to deal with it, because okay, yeah. Cool. And if someone else has the answer for him, please go ahead. Hi. Um, as you already mentioned, this is used in lots of the root DNS servers to provide some more locality to the network location where you are. And I think it just announces uh, several prefixes in the BGP and then just the normal BGP selection process for uh, network is nearer kicks in and just picks the route which is from where you are nearer to you, without any extra effort, which is why it's so nice. Yeah, it probably handles the equal path by choosing one, which is good enough for our case. As long as it doesn't send one packet, one packet, one packet, one packet, you'll be fine for most services. Anybody else? Going once? Uh, I remember IP tables at some point had this uh, ability to filter by command. 
itself. You could provide a filter by PID, not PID, by the name of the command, which kind of interfaces. But then it was removed. Is namespace is kind of good alternative to jail processes? So they, so I could provide a specific per process um, IP tables firewall. I, I suppose you can do that. So if you insulate your process in a different network namespace, then you can easily do that. But you can do it probably easier with users. So IP tables can just filter depending on the user. So if you run your processes under different usernames, then you can apply different IP tables rules. And in this case, you wouldn't add the overhead of an additional VATH interface and an additional routing mm -hmm. table lookup and things like that if you just want to apply different rules to different processes. Yeah, let's say Firefox. I want to limit it. And I still want it to be under my user, I guess. Yeah, then, then you probably may want to try that. So mm -hmm. the only problem is that you need to be root in order to start these containers. But then you can drop <coughs> root privileges under the container, start Firefox, and yeah, then you can easily on the host, so on the external part, say, well, traffic that comes from vir this virtual Ethernet interface is firewall this way. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Uh, the things that are missing maybe are TC and uh, maybe some traffic shaping and then uh, link layer uh, discovery things like uh, LLDP or CDPR, things like that. Okay, uh, can you send me an email with these names and I'll look it up for my, the next time I'll give this talk. Oh, another thing which I found today on the 35 kernel, which was just released last week or something, was that there is this IP tables T support to duplicate packets, which I'm sure I'm going to have lots of fun with. Just saying. If, if we have reached the wish list things here, then uh, fair queuing. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Uh, I, I, you, every right, time I googled right. about it, I found things in in Polish, and I don't read Polish. It was oh, the, I mean, well, yeah, so. yeah, totally makes sense. Yes. <laughs> so QS. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Um, I have a question regarding something in between any cast on IP tunneling. Is there a way to use IP tunneling, mapping, uh, unicast address to a broadcast one, and <laughs> then maybe with UDP packets I would get lowest latency response and be able I'm to process totally that? Not sure. I'm totally got lost halfway through the question. <laughs> maybe okay. we want to talk later with a diagram because I, I totally got lost. There was too many layers of interaction, sorry. Okay, we'll talk after <laughs> the talk. More questions. Otherwise, we can go early, have a coffee, relax, make the video team rest. <laughs> Sounds good. I'm Any sure the video question? team will no? appreciate it. Okay. Thanks, Thanks very much again. for attending. Um, I hope it was fun. <laughs> <laughs>